briefing. Um, members uh, want to be clear of who we have present at the moment. Um, in the room, along with myself, we have Kelly Armstrong and Andy Allen. And on the telephone lines at the moment, we have Mark Durkin, Fran McCann, Sinead Innes, Robin Newton, Jonathan Buckley, and um, Carol hopefully will be joining us very soon. Okay? Members, can I just remind you um, again to put your phones on to mute whenever you're not speaking? Um, the, the sound system isn't the best um, at the best of times without any background noise, so if members could just be aware of that and please put your phones on to mute. That will help us all. Um, so I'm going to move on then to agenda item number one, which is apologies, and at the moment we don't have any apologies, so I'll move on then to item number two, which is chairperson's business, and I have no business to relate on to you either. And then, so I'm going to just move on to agenda item number three, which is the draft minutes. Members, you'll find these in your meeting packs of, um, from the 13th of May on page six of your meeting packs. Um, are members content with the minutes as drafted? <coughs> yes. All content? Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, Chair. Yes, Mark. Uh, there's just there item number six, the solace briefing. Yes. I had declared an interest, but my wife is not a local councillor. She is a council okay. employee. Okay, we will amend that, Mark. Not a problem. Um, okay, so, are members content then with the minutes as amended? Yes. Content? Very Grant, thank you. We'll move on then to agenda item number four, which is matters arising. Um, first of all, members, you've been provided a page 13 with the latest report from the examiner of statutory rules. The examiner draws attention to SR 2020-45, the Employment and Support Alliance and Housing Benefit Transitional Provisions Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, the rule was led in breach of the 21-day rule which was due to the COVID-19 crisis. The examiner is satisfied with the department's explanation. Um, can I ask members, first of all, in the room, are you content to note that? Yes? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Members on the phone content to note, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. then the second item is um, at page 21, you'll find a letter from the minister in relation to the sports COVID-19 hardship fund. Um, just remind members that Sports NI will be coming in to uh, brief the committee um, at a future meeting. But can I ask our members, first of all, in the room, are you content to note that also? Could I, to hold on. We're with the room first. I'll come to the phones in a minute. Go ahead, Kelly. Chair, could I ask in advance of the Sport NI if we could get a copy of the criteria that they're using? That's the first we've seen that anybody mention a criteria because originally it seemed to be first come, first served. Yeah. Um, it would be very useful if they are using a criteria to maybe say that in advance of their presentation. Okay, no problem. Okay, members on the phones, did someone want to come in there and reference this? Sure. Johnny here. Johnny, go ahead. Um, it's probably on the back of what Kelly said, and I did raise this in the House yesterday, because uh, I know there's been particular problems with this scheme, given that it closed in two days due to demand and lack of uh, funds, so it's suspended. Um, I have written a question to the community minister, but it would be good probably for the committee to inquire as well. The eligibility uh, criteria for the specific scene and if there was any equality impact assessment done in relation to how the, the fund will be distributed across the different sporting sectors. I also believe it would be helpful for the committee to receive formally a breakdown of uh, the current um, applications that have been awarded in relation to the sporting Organisations. I know that is available. It has been written to or out to specific members that have asked for it. Uh, but I think it would be good for the committee to have that. But not also the ones that have been awarded, but also the ones that are still currently in the system. Okay, Johnny. Well done. Thank you. Anybody else? Any comment on that? No. no. Okay. We'll move on then to the next item on, on, on this, which is, you'll find it page 23, um, and that is from the department in reply to committee queries on the social supermarket pilot. Again, I'll ask members in the room, are you content to note? Yes. Yep, content. Members on the phone, content to note? Content. Good stuff. Content. Thank you. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. Um, agenda item number sure. five. Sorry. 
Before we move on, Kelly. Yes, sorry. I was just wondering. I know that um, at last week's meeting that we had talked about um, asking the committee for finance for comments back regarding the re the raise template. Um, it's not on this, so I take it they haven't come back. But I just wanted to raise an issue. Um, our minutes, we had recorded difficulty with the telephone conferencing system before. Unfortunately, there seems to be some misrepresentation. Um, I know that a letter was to be sent to the senior management team to, to let them know, but um, I've received correspondence back just as a, a, an MLA saying that um, we thought it was fine. That's not the case. Last week, I think we did say, and, and we were writing to them to say that, that the telecommunications wasn't good. Um, it was just to highlight that under the matters arising that... Um, if that letter has gone to the S senior management team? Uh, uh, short answer is yes, it has. It's yeah. sent to the Director of Parliamentary Services. I'll, I can circulate it after the meeting. That'll be good, yeah, be good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, members, content to move on then. Thank you. Yes, Carol, go ahead. So, um, the thing that uh, I remember Kathy raised that last week, so uh, maybe she could clear this up for me. So, it was a raised paper that had that word in it. But we're asking DFP for clarification on it. Committee's committee. No, are the finance committee. The finance committee. Sorry, finance committee. Yes, finance committee. Should we not be asking Ray why it was in there in the first place? Um, yeah, uh, uh, Carl's Kevin here. Um, yes, yeah, so I spoke to my my colleague in. Uh, the, the Committee for Finance regarding this, and he's, he's going to be writing back very soon. We've asked for uh, um, that this, raise this issue, saying that the committee it caused some confusion in that committee, and asked for comment on uh, its inclusion. Uh, I think the, the confusion around it lies in the definition of conclusory, and conclusory really means don't provide any, don't make any statements that you cannot back up with evidence. Uh, so what they were saying to the departments were, in fact, don't make statements that you, you can't provide uh, evidence to uh, sustain, otherwise the committees will undoubtedly you know, investigate further. So it was, uh, I suppose, um, if not a shot across the brow, just some advice to the departments o on that. So I, I, I don't think there was much meant, I don't think it, it was confusion at committee level, but I don't think the, um, it, 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 obviously it wasn't meant to cause confusion, but I think it, would, it perhaps would have been better if they just used a more a, a simpler form of words, you know, to indicate that, you know, in other words, please do not use uh, to make statements that you cannot provide uh, evidence to uh, underpin. Otherwise, the committees will come back, and, and that's really it. So we've only asked the, the committee for communities: uh, have they received uh, any additional comment, or do they have comment to make on the inclusion of that statement? Okay, Carol. Yes, that bit clearer? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. No problem. All right, then we're going to move on to agenda item five, which is correspondence. Um, members, you'll find the correspondence memo at page 25 of your meeting pack. Um, I'm going to go to members in the room first. Is there anything um, that you want to bring up on that, members in the room, in correspondence? No? Okay. Can I go then to the dial-in members? Um, anything you want to bring up under correspondence? Uh, oh. Sure, yes. Johnny here. Okay, Johnny, go ahead. I realise we've received a correspondence there from Kevin Stevens, executive of the Union of Ireland Golfing Association. Yeah. Um, and I realise now that this probably is outdated given the executive's initiation of phase one and golf being included. Yeah. But is it possible, as a committee, could we return a letter to them? Um, inquiring if there's been any further problems as to the relief of phase one because my, my problem is that there's there's some confusion out there in relation to is it particularly um is it there, there, some of the golf clubs are only allowing members only for example but that's not uh, specified within the executive plan that's individual golfing unions and clubs coming with that decision so i would just like to hear from them as the representative body has there been any problems uh, in relation to the executive's decision to go ahead with this, which I welcome, but I just want to ensure that there's a fluidity and, you know, a, a common approach across the board, if that's possible. Okay, no, I think you make a very good point. I think they were duly open today, um, golf clubs, so, and uh, just to see whether it is just for private, for membership, or for the wider public. Um, no, we can certainly uh, do, do a letter back to them to ask, um, uh, are all clubs, you know, following the, a uniform 
uh, rules or if they all doing their own thing. Um, Kelly, you wanted to come in on that? I was just going to say um, I made the mistake of putting out in social media, you know, thinking that the four to six people outdoors qualified for golf clubs, but I was pointed in the direction of the Golfing Union of Ireland's own protocol, and it states its members only and only up to three people can play at any one time, obviously with social distancing. But um, I'm just wondering, as, as Johnny has said, you know, could we just get clarification that that's out with all golf clubs? Because um, if it's coming from the Golfing Union of Ireland, and I think it's the Ladies Golfing Union, um, that protocol seems to be quite detailed and um, quite descriptive. Um, it's just to make sure, I suppose, that that's across everywhere. Okay, no, we'll do that. Um, that's fine. Anybody else, any other comments or on the correspondence memo? No. Well, then, can I ask members then on dial in first of all, are you content um, as action set out in the correspondence memo? Yeah. Yeah. Very content. Okay, and in the room, yeah? Yes. Okay, thank you, members. We're going to then move on now to agenda item number six, which is a briefing by CO3 and NICVA on the impact of COVID 19 on the charity voluntary and community sector. Members, you've been provided with briefing paper at page 66 of your pack and also provided um, links to a recent online surveys by NICVA and these are in your tabled items. Can I um, offer a welcome to Nora Smith, Chief Executive of CO3 and Seamus McAlevey, Chief Executive of NICVA. Um, you're both very welcome here with us today. And can I ask then, uh, Nora, if you want to begin? Sure, just very quickly. Oh, sorry, before just before you start. Can I, can I declare an interest as a charity trustee and the charity in which I'm a trustee of as a member of NICVA? No problem, that's fine. Um, Nora, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, firstly, Paula and um, the committee, thank you for the opportunity to present today. And for us, it provides a platform to share an extremely challenging picture for the charity sector as a direct result of COVID-19. Can you hear okay? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah. Go ahead, Nora. Okay, brilliant. So for a significant proportion of charities, they have experienced a marked increase in demand for their services, supporting individuals, supporting families here in a vulnerable position because of their health, because of their age, because of their disability and or because of their family circumstances. Yet for many in the sector, they have experienced substantial losses of income, but are continuing to provide key services. So they're delivering them in new ways to ensure that lifelines of support and key services are delivered to those who are most at risk and most exposed to COVID-19. So our sector has stepped up, and rightly so. However, the financial support that is being afforded to the private sector to protect cash flow has not been available to the vast majority of members. So I'm engaging with members on a daily basis, and at this point, collectively, you're looking at tens of millions of lost income. So it was good to hear Minister Hardy in the Assembly yesterday and the impressive support that they're already offering to our most vulnerable through the advice services, the safe delivery of medicines and the food parcels. And I know from my conversations with officials that they're working around the clock responding to COVID-19. However, that said, the release of the 15 and a half million has been frustratingly so. So I hope that the announcement that is due later this week is the opening of the fund alongside the criteria and the timelines. So we're approaching the end of week nine of lockdown with tens of millions of pounds of lost income, increased demand for services and with no financial support. So it's, it really is a triple whammy. So the promise of fund has to materialise into the opening of the fund. Um, the 15.5 million unfortunately falls well short of what the sector needs. So my ask of committee members today to our politicians, to government, <coughs> is that we can't assume that this 15.5 million solves the charity, um, the, 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 the crisis um, as a result of COVID-19 in the charity sector. We, what we're lobbying really hard for is that this has to be the start of a wider package of support. You know, it, it only represents a very small sticking plaster. So we have seen um, hundreds of millions of pounds issued to the private sector, and yet for charities, we're holding our breath in the hope that the 15.5 million application process will offer some hope, offer an injection of cash flow. And I'm not suggesting that it has to be an either or scenario between our two sectors. It's just shockingly poor that for many in the in this wider third sector, charities and social enterprises have not been able to access any financial support. So in the charities, they've shown 
incredible leadership in the early days and now in the midst of COVID-19, creating a safe environment for staff, for volunteers and for the people that they were set up to serve and support. And they're balancing this against dramatic losses of income. It's one of the biggest ironies of this crisis is that charities who are currently not in receipt of public sector funding um, who either choose a social enterprise path or they're raising their income through charity shops, donations and events, they are most exposed to this as their income model, their business model, for some has literally dissolved overnight. So staff represents the biggest share of the sector's cost base. So a proposal that we have put forward is around furloughing. So obviously furloughing has provided a lifeline for some charities, but it doesn't protect or offer support. So essentially what you're asking is for staff to step down at exactly the time that you need them to, start, to step up. So we have asked for a small change to the furlough scheme to allow staff who have been furloughed to volunteer back in to deliver key services um, and for us, you know, that could be a game changer. That could provide a real lifeline. It protects cash flow and it protects key services. It's not going to cost the government any more money. And what we're already seeing is that vital activity is already being scaled back because of dramatic losses of income. So there's a real danger that some of those services will be scaled back further or completely stopped because of the financial dire straits that the sector's in. So we developed a range of different asks. One is the furlough and the change to it to allow furlough staff to volunteer back into their organisation. We're also calling for the immediate opening of the £15.5 million fund. Um, but this has to be the start of a wider financial package of support. In, in Scotland, you saw, I think, within the first week, there was a third sector resilience fund that was opened, and there's about 500 charities have already got support through that. We need a third sector resilience fund to support um, the charities through this crisis and then after this crisis. And that concludes my opening remarks. Okay, thank you, Nora. Seamus, if you want to add to that? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to the committee uh, for the invitation to talk to you. I wouldn't disagree with the comments that Nora has made, uh, specifically about charities who raise a lot of their money direct from the public. Uh, they have been hit very hard by the lockdown in that all those fundraising activities have come to a complete halt, uh, and therefore they're becoming starved of cash. On the upside of things, I think it's important to set the context that Voluntary and community organisations that have had a financial relationship with government <coughs> through grant aid uh, or in contracts, uh, we have managed to get all of that sorted out. The Minister for Communities uh, Department took the lead and uh, guaranteed those funds and accepted that organisations needed to pivot with regard to the work that they were doing so that they would shift more to the, the COVID-19 response. And as Nora said, uh, organizations have done incredibly well on that. Uh, the minister set up an emergencies leadership group on the 20th of March. Uh, we're engaged in that as a range of organizations are. And we and Nick are looking after engagement and communications with the sector and government. And I have to say, People are collaborating like never before. Our websites, in terms of Community NI, are carrying all the services that individual voluntary and community groups are providing to people, particularly in need at this, at this time. There's well over 500 services with regard to uh, COVID-19 support, particularly to people who are, who are isolating. And that site can be looked at by district council area to see what uh, services are available uh, in your area. As I say, the spontaneous responders were out straight away at our sector, and a lot of community groups were providing food and uh, hot food before uh, you know government arrived. But obviously, as part of the emergencies leadership group, there's major streams of work around food parcels. Uh, around community helpline, uh, around volunteering, uh, the delivery of medicines, 
and you know range of range of other, other things. Other departments followed communities and have generally guaranteed the funds to organisations that that they were were funding. But the big outstanding issue, obviously, is, is this one of organisations not in receipt of uh, of any form of public sector support. And while all organisations are down money, they're in the difficult position. And as Nora mentioned, the the £15 million fund that has been announced by the Finance Minister and uh, Minister for Communities is really, lots of organisations are contacting me and, uh, and asking me when and where and how they access it. Now, we and ICFA are engaged with the department on it. There's a lot of discussion has been going on about how to stand up this fund, uh, a brand new fund, trying to establish what the need is. And I think the minister will be ready to outline very shortly some of the, de the, the detail around that. And it will try to help those who are most in need and to keep those organizations afloat uh, in the immediate period ahead. As Nora mentioned about furlough, and we have raised this with Treasury, we've raised <coughs> it with the Secretary of State in Northern Ireland, we've raised it with departmental officials. If uh, people who are placed on furlough within voluntary organisations were allowed to volunteer within the organisation that they, uh, they're furloughed from, it would allow us to use them at their highest value. They can volunteer with any other organisation but we think there's a lot of public benefit if they could work within their own. People who can do very good work with cancer patients are much better doing that. So in an organization like Cancer Focus, when they furlough people, the only people that really suffer are the patients who they would have been normally, normally helping. Now, the organization does suffer serious financial impact itself, but I'm saying the real... <coughs> Uh, weight, weight of the issue falls actually with the, benef the beneficiaries. So if we could square that, and we understand the reason that Treasury didn't want to do it was the dangers of fraud or people manipulating the furlough scheme, but if we, if we could change that for charities, it would be a big public benefit. And uh, that's all from me at, at this point, and I'm happy, happy to take questions. Paula. Uh, thank you, thank you, both of you. Um, I think it's it's fair to say, and I want to put on the record, you know, the voluntary um, community and charitable sectors have gone um, above and beyond in recent weeks in delivering that much needed help out there within our community. So kind of, I, I want to say a massive thank you and ask you to pass that on um, to all of those groups that you represent. And, and I, I, I know for some of those groups that you represent, um, people maybe haven't seen that in action because they're working behind the scenes. And I, I know for some of those charities, because I've spoken to some of them, um, the, the, the level of, of phone calls that they are receiving um, from, from their various client groups has increased tenfold in recent weeks. So some of it has been directly related um, to COVID-19, but some of it is indirectly as well. So can you just please pass on first and foremost a massive thank you and a massive thank you to both of you as well for all of the work that you've been doing. Um, I just want to then just draw out a few points there that you made. Um, uh, first, of, first of all, on, on the furlough, Seamus, um, just uh, at what stage are we now with that exactly, um, uh, uh, you know, on, on, on trying to get that sorted? Well, as I say, I uh, talked about four weeks ago to the Permanent Secretary in the NIO and explained the situation. She under, understood it. Uh, we've been making representations at Treasury level as well. Generally, anyone you talk to understands it and says, yes, that would be worth doing. Mm -hmm. I suspect uh, Treasury's reticence will always be the danger is that people will find opportunities to exploit uh, the scheme. Because I think the, the, you know, the danger is that some employers unscrupulously could have just used it as a, uh, as a, a subsidy, uh, a wage sub subsidy. So but we're getting that, more that words could have, from that people. That could have been used by anybody from any yeah. business, yeah. you know, um, yeah. exploitation. So it's not, I, I, don't, I don't see how they can use that as just an excuse um, for your... I the black position. So there's yeah. more words, Paula, but we're not seeing any action on it yet. 
Okay. Okay. We we James and I were both on a call with the Secretary of State last Friday and we raised it with him. And again, mm-hmm. as James has said, you know, we feel very <coughs> encouraged and could see the benefit of it. Um, and had committed to taking it away and coming back in a couple of weeks' time. Um, you know, obviously time is of the essence and tandem to that as well. We've been conversing with, with Claire Hannah, for one of our MPs here. He's now got cross party support, not just within Northern Ireland, but across the UK, to amend a, a small change to the furlough scheme could be a game changer for lots of our members. Yeah, and I suppose, I mean, Nora, you had in your report had talked about the, the potential collapse of the sector. Um, if if government um, schemes fail fail here, and you know that will have a major knock on effect on on our public sector then going forward, which will be under immense pressure, and that was under immense pressure prior to the COVID nineteen. Um, so it's just um, that constant um, uh, negotiations with with um, the UK or with Westminster government needs to continue in order that we don't see that collapse and that we don't see an over an overburdens on the public sector. Um, also, I just want to ask also what input that you have had as representatives um, on the process to do with the funding. We know the 15 million funding that the minister announced yesterday, and I believe you had said there in your briefing that um, the, the, the scheme to allocate the money, the criteria, hasn't been set out yet. Um, what part are you playing with in all of that? Can I, uh, if I could say, Chair, I'm involved uh, and being consulted by the department officials that are taking the scheme forward. So I meet regularly with them once or twice a week. Uh, I'm not involved in co-designing the scheme, but I have been advising them in terms of uh, background of the sector, impact, uh, what I think is the important things to do. Uh, so we've been we've been consulted, as I say. I'm not privy then to ultimately the papers that the department develops, uh, but certainly have had every opportunity to input into the process. Okay. And in terms of our input, what we're saying to department officials and with with said to political spads as well, if you keep this <coughs> keep it simple, um, make sure it's transparent. Um, independent, you know, you've got independent funders out there, such as Big Ladder and Community Foundations. We have the resources and the capacity to get this funding out, you know, as, as soon as soon as possible. So utilise those funders. Make sure that it's transparent. Keep it a simple process. The reality is, and I think JJ Hargey made reference to this yesterday. There are going to be more losers and more people disappointed than not because it is a relatively small pot, so there are difficult decisions to be made, and hopefully now they have decided on the criteria, so it's, it's, it's now just a matter of urgency, it's just getting it open and getting it out and into the sector as being asked. Can I just ask then on another point as well, and I think I, I read something that you'd sent through this morning, Seamus, and that's to do with the, the 40 million hardship fund for micro businesses, um, which was to, is to include social enterprises and charities. Um, you had expressed some concern around that. Could you go into just a wee bit more detail around that, Seamus? Yeah, all, all we have raised with us by organisations, social enterprise organisations, is their inability to access any of the economy funds. Now, these organisations trade. Uh, some of them are involved broadly in uh, hospitality type issues. They, uh, they run venues, provide food, all of that. And exactly like any other business, it's just absolutely stopped dead. But because there seem to be something different, economy seems to have left them out yeah. and they're literally caught between two two stools and to them it certainly seems very unfair they were encouraged to government to create these self-sustaining businesses the only thing different between these organizations and the private sector one is they don't distribute their profits you know to shareholders they <coughs> uh, invest back in the activity so we've made representations recently to the to the minister, 
and uh, you know would hope that the minister would be able to look at we think what is an anomaly, uh, and I'm hopeful. And we've also made representation of the committee, uh, uh, as has the you know other groups as well. You know so. But as I say, a lot of organisations feeling really, really sore and let down. But those discussions are ongoing then with the with the Minister for the Economy? They're ongoing, they're, yes. Yeah, they've been going going for a number of weeks since the crisis has hit. You know, Social Enterprise and I have been leading the way on this. And it is extremely frustrating. And I, I think there's potentially... A, it just, this just underlines there's a fundamental lack of understanding of what a social enterprise is and that there's nearly, I, I don't know what, why they haven't included them, whether there's a fear that they're going to be double funded through the FC and the and Department of Economy. And as Seamus has said, we have fallen between the, the two stools and are operating in good faith, hoping that something will, will come along in terms of financial support and assistance. But not in today's, and you know the the, um, the stance the Department of Economy has taken has been very disappointing. Okay, um, I'm going to um, open it up to members, and I'm going to go to the phone lines first, uh, and then I'll go into the room. Um, I'm going to start then with Mark. Any questions or comment? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks to Nora and Seamus uh, for the presentation. There, we covered the. Uh, most of what I was going to uh, share, uh, like yourself, I would say that for a little proposal there is one that is reasonable and, and, and creative. Uh, in, in terms of that, ask the Treasury, in effect, around that flexibility in the furlough scheme. What is happening in the other regions? And I know you mentioned the Scotland and the, their resilience fund, but on the actual furlough issue, are, 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 are the sector in England and Scotland and Wales making much noise on this uh, themselves? Yeah, um, I know MBCO, um, Carl Wilding, who leads up that, has been very vocal and, you know, is really flying the flag for England along with Akivo. Um, so in Scotland, it's been raised as a solution as well um, but unfortunately, there hasn't been any movement on it. So, from what we're setting, it's how can we put as much pressure on the Westminster, on Treasury, to see this as a solution which isn't going to cost them any more money. Text actually probably save their money in the longer term. So, you know, what can the committee do? What can the assembly do? What can the executive do? What can our MP do? Um, just to keep that pressure on and to get that decision made sooner rather than later. Yeah, well, yes, I think that, no, yeah, if I could say, Mark, I think the Northern Ireland Assembly could support that call. Uh, the same is the case in England, Scotland, Wales. Uh, as Nora says, N NCBO is our sister council. Uh, we meet weekly with NCBO, the Scottish Council, and the Welsh Council for Voluntary Action as well. And as for, uh, we have put it to the Cabinet Office as well about the issue of of furlough. So uh, Cabinet Office and Treasury should be in little doubt mm -hmm. what what organisations in our sector are, are looking for. It's a question of whether they can deliver and have the will to do it. Yeah, and, and I, I, I could detect in your presentation a degree of frustration, I suppose, that this hasn't happened yet here in terms of, of the support fund. Uh, the 15.5 million, you think it's too little. It's also too too late. But I'd like to think that the, the delay is down to the, the time and the effort maybe being put into the design of the scheme. And I also was interested in what input the sector themselves would have to that. So, so I was interested in that answer. It's, it's slightly important that, that this is, is done right. But and I'm not being critical of BFC uh, in, in this respect, but just judging by all the other support mechanisms that have, have come out, there's clearly difficulty <laughs> in, in getting it right and in getting something that, 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 that catches all and supports everyone. 
and and you're not going to get a criteria system that catches everybody because there's not enough funding in the past today, then. And I agree. I accept that uh, as well, Mark. And I know that the DLC <coughs> scheme that the minister is pursuing, pursuing will not be a flat rate one. So it'll not be like economy where flat rate amounts are given out to a very broad range of organisations. Uh, they are looking at a scheme that tries to respond to individual need. So it'll have to deal with large organisations, medium-sized ones and small ones. And it'll have to look closely as to how it's fair uh, to all of them. So that's why I accept there's a level of complexity in this. It's just not as easy as say, oh, we've got the money, let's just open the door and, and put it out there. I, I fully understand that that is not an easy thing. And I know that the officials working on it are working very hard, even though people like me are saying, can you hurry, can you hurry, you know? Yeah, and, and as, as well as hearing that, that bit of frustration, I think what was also evident was, was a bit of fear as well. I mean, you clearly have genuine concerns about the, the, the future of some organisations out there doing extremely valuable work. And uh, it, it's work that they need to be back at. You know, the society needs them back, back there doing it. So thank you, and you certainly have uh, my support and my party's support in your ass. Okay, Mark, thank you. Carol? Carol? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Nora and Shema, for your presentation and your papers. I suppose um, there isn't enough money in this past to go around everything. And the question I would have is, while Shema, she says you're not involved in co-design, you're obviously going to have some influence to bear on given the regular contact that you have with departmental officials. So, in your opinion, um, what what sort of group or charity should be applying to this? Well, I think this is very much for those who have lost uh, their independent income and who rely very heavily on that. Organisations in our sector are funded by a whole variety of different sources. And I know there are some large mental health organisations, and the majority of their money comes from health trusts and that by, by contracts. Mm -hmm. So some of them will be serving <coughs> okay. There are lots of organisations that are working with local communities and are supported by uh, neighbourhood renewal and things, things like that. And, you know, the, the minister in the department has, you know, put all that money out there. And a lot of them will be will be okay, and this is in the immediate term. But it's all these ones then who relied on the big fundraisers from the public, you know, income from uh, sponsorship at marathons and all of all of that. So it has to target those organisations that are most in need, which I believe is its intention. And its intention is also to try and give them enough money. It can't give them all the money that they've lost. But can it give them enough money to help them survive the year? Because there's going to be a long, hard climb out of this year. Even when the lockdown ends, fundraising will take a long time to get back to where, to where it was. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Seamus has said there. Um, the reality is, for those charities that do raise their income, you know, 80, 90, 95%, through either social enterprise model or through event income and individual giving, their losses are have been dramatic. And so I was speaking to, to Declan from Chess Heart Stroke at the end of last week. Last April, they raised £11,000 in income. This April, they've raised £65. You know, so this, and that's just one of many examples you know, um, Seamus quoted Cancer Focus earlier in terms of them withdrawing some of their counselling support services in a really different position for them. They're looking at a million and a half pound of a loss by July. So, you know, serious and dramatic losses and no financial support and an increased demand for services. 
So it's it's really difficult, and you are like getting asked the club as some of our most loved, loved and taken for granted charities that have always been there because of the direct impact that COVID's had on them. <coughs> Yes, Carl, go ahead. So, you know, that, that's clear. But I just want to, and I know, I know you know this, because I know you are very much involved with some of the groups, but even some of those groups who are either funded under neighbourhood or new or areas at risk, some of the work that they're doing, and it, it's funded up until a point, but I know several groups in your seat of money from PHA and neighbourhood or new still go out and shake buckets and collect stuff, like, for example, collecting money to provide, you know, food, um, collecting money to provide mental health services, particularly for adolescent teenagers, and consultants in. And that goes right through from that, right through to the big ones, like the hospices and the action cancers and chest, heart and stroke. So anything that we can do by way of support um, then I think you'll not have anyone on the, the committee's committee objecting to that. In fact, you know, we're basically asking well, what else is that we can do. But I do believe that coming out of this, um, you know, the, the issue for me is that particularly for groups who were advised some time ago to go down the, the, the business route, the, you know, small and medium enterprise, still have charitable purposes. I think that's, for me, where the big gap has been. And if, um, if anything, you know, even the correspondence or even if you want to shorten some of that up, we'd be, I'd be advocating that we send it to the Economies Committee and even into the Department. I know the part of before, but it's just that, um, you know, if it's something that they're, they're getting three times, fine, but we don't want to take the rest of them not getting it at all. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, uh, let me see, Robin, any comment or, qu or query? Robin? Thank you, Chair. Uh, really appreciate the, the delegation uh, coming here uh, to, to speak to us. I, I, I suppose, uh, I think it was Nora in her opening remarks, made some words like there was an increased demand uh, for charitable support. And I think we'd have been surprised if we hadn't heard that under today's circumstances. I have to say I'm guilty uh, actually of adding to that through referrals to charitable organisations, uh, and I think that indicates the, uh, the the level of confidence that one would have in the uh, charitable bodies and social enterprise area. I, I wonder, Chair, could I just ask? Um, I suppose when society is getting to uh, a situation where cancer charities, autism charities. Charities concerned with learning disabilities are indicating to you that they're under threat. And indeed, they just seem to be now such a, an integral part of our society. Uh, and we, I suppose, in many ways have taken them for granted uh, over, over the past number of years. But when they are under threat, um, I think we then start to realize the, the, the real value of them. So, I, I mean, I, I think... Uh, Carol McQuillan there said about uh, support. Uh, I don't think there would be anybody around the table or around the phone in lines who, who wouldn't be offering a, a level of support to to those who are making the representation today. Can I just ask uh, the question, a simple question, though, Chair? And Mark Durkin complained that you had taken his question. Chair Mark Durkin took my question uh, <laughs> as well. Um, are there charities outside of the representation being made today who are also in a suffering and, and similar situation as those who are being represented today? Maybe that's an unfair question, Chair. I'm sure they can answer it, Robin. I didn't completely yeah. pick it up. Are there all, are there... Yeah, maybe I'll... Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Shiva. Yeah. I'll pick it up. Our attitude in ICFA, Robin, has been like we, we have 1,100 member organizations. Yeah. But as soon as this crisis, and, and I would engage re regularly with them, as soon as this crisis started, we changed everything uh, to support for organizations in the, in the crisis. So instead of talking to 1,100 members, I now talk to 6,000 uh, people representing all organizations. 
and all our representation, and I'm sure it's absolutely the same for Nora, is for the sector in general, not like my members or her members or, yeah. or anybody else. And right across the board, I don't know any organization who's not taken a big hit. You know, I don't know any organization that isn't caught up badly in this, in the financial side. And I know lots that are doing outstanding work. You know, if you take your constituency, East Belfast Community Development Organization and a range uh, of community organizations just sprung into action yeah. as soon as this started. And they identified all the people who were at risk and isolating and who needed help, and they've organized it. That's happening in Carroll's constituency in North Belfast. And in North Belfast, they're really working right across the uh, so-called divide uh, in the area. Same when you go west, and in, and in other places, it's exactly the same. So there's a definite thing of everybody being in this together, Robin, and thinking of the public good, and that has been really the, the upside of it. What we will need to do when we get out of the crisis is start thinking about those values that you talked about and about organizations that are actually so important and deliver such critical services. We've now found out how actually really, really valuable they are. And I think we have to think about about that in the future in terms of how we prioritize public services and help to people going forward. Yeah, can I, can I chair, uh, let me also say to EBCDA that they just uh, became phenomenal. Uh, I think there's no other word to describe uh, how they, as your words, uh, Seamus, swung into action uh, on the matter and indeed have crossed my what might be regarded as the traditional divides in the work they're doing. Sure, I, I am pleased with, with those words from Seamus that they've moved from the, the 1,100 contacts to over 6,000 contacts. Uh, and I think that, that again, is, is showing a, 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 an amazing amount of initiative in the thing uh, and really worthy of support. I, I suppose, Chair, sure, we, we'll come to the end of the meeting and we can make through you what decisions we are making in terms of representation on behalf uh, of, of, of the uh, sector. But uh, I would suggest to you that we might want to consider writing directly to the Chancellor on the matter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Um, can I bring in Fra? Can you hear me, Chair? I can indeed, Fra. Go ahead. Chair, uh, I, I, I know... Robin was complaining about uh, people stealing his questions. Well, they've all stole my questions. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I would like to say, uh, thank Seamus and Nora for the presentation today. I think that uh, it's very timely. I think that uh, we, talk, we continuously talk and use the word heroes. And uh, I think the community, along with all, all the other people, have rose, risen to the occasion, uh, been on the streets every day. And I think when this uh, is, is over. I think we can never go back to uh, what it was like before this. I think that, that there has to be a recognition of uh, the work uh, that communities done, uh, and rather than ignoring them as it has happened in the past, bring them central to the NDI discussions that have taken place, and that goes for the authorities also. I think we all need to go the extra mile uh, if we can uh, to ensure that that one group falls because of the good work that they're doing. But I think uh, 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 anything that we can do uh, to, uh, to help and assist those groups, we should. And I think Robin has made suggestions, and I think Carl's made suggestions. I think what we need to do is the approach here, we need the approach uh, to find out what avenues is open uh, for groups like this. I do appreciate, in terms of social enterprises, that there are many groups out there uh, that, that, that are uh, left out and be left out, and we need to reach out to them also uh, to ensure that they don't become victims uh, of uh, the, the, the lack of finance and to it. Okay, thank you, Fran. I couldn't agree with you more, and I think that is exactly, I think that end bit is exactly right. We don't want to see any of these groups that have worked so, so very hard 
um, in recent weeks, but, you know, falling in and becoming a victim of all of this. Um, we want to make sure that, that they're, they're, they're repaid as well for the work that they've been done by keeping them afloat. Um, so thank you, Fra, for that. Um, I'll move on then to Johnny. Have you any questions or comments? Yes, thank you, Chair, and suppose some of the points have been covered, but firstly, thank you for the presentation today, and thank you for the work that the charity and voluntary organisations are doing in this difficult time. I suppose probably a start brief comment in relation to the furlough. Um, again, the point was made earlier in the presentation, you know, at a time whenever people should be stepping up, not stepping back, this, what I would call, it's a, almost like a technicality, ha has barred... People, and it's, it's, it's welcome to see people that are willing to, even though they've been furloughed for, for good reason, that potentially, in, in particular in the charity sector, and we've mentioned some of the sensitive cases involved, whether it's through cancer patients, etc., that they're willing to come in on a voluntary basis uh, to, to work with, with not only those patients, but also those that are in care across the different charity sectors. And I think uh, it has been somewhat disgraceful that that has been overlooked to date. And I would certainly add my way to that of the other committee members that have already mentioned this, to try and push this as far as we can, whether that be right to the Chancellor, as has been suggested, or by any other means, we must explore that and, and use that mechanism to see, again, it's of no additional cost, um, and if it's particularly pertaining to the charity sector, there's no reason why it can't be successful, in particular, over the difficult few months it's coming, we've already heard that furlough has been extended, but this particular peak uh, technicality has changed what gives uh, some charities that security in, in, in the immediate future. And uh, the second point in which maybe you could comment back, which is um, what discussions were had with the Department of the Economy in relation to the exclusion of charities in the micro business scheme? Um, I'd be keen to hear the, the detail on that and, and as to, to if there's a for that to be looked at or even from the committee's perspective to pursue with the department. Uh, and thirdly, and Carol mentioned this point, I'll just give it all to you in, in once, is the, the criteria and the uh, eligibility requirements are going to be key. Well, we know that there's not enough money within the fund to, to do it all, but it will be key. Um, regarding the design that, you, that, that Carol had mentioned, um, how confident are you that you've got your message across in relation to what would be required? And potentially, um, I know you've focused on those businesses that have received no other government funding by other streams, but we do know that in particular there is uh, charity organisations who, are by and large, are, grant, are funded through departments or, or different avenues, but they're still up to 20% or more, which is relied, reliant upon income, whether that's through all usage or uh, tuck shops, etc., uh, and, and therefore they're laying this staff who should be on the front line like COVID, but unfortunately, because of the financial situation, can't do so. So maybe just comment on those points. Yeah, maybe take the, you know, the last one. Uh, all organisations, I think it's relative, all organisations are, are certainly hurting and losing money. Organisations are quite often funded by a cocktail uh, of funds and sources. So I'll use my own for, for an example of my own in NICFA. Uh, you know, we raise and spend about two million, two million pounds a year. About a third of our income comes from a government grant. Uh, a third of it then comes from raising other funds, you know, for, for projects. And a third of it comes from what we call earned income. So carrying out our rooms, running events, charging for training. And that is a knock-on effect. We, we pay out a couple of thousand pounds a month to another voluntary organisation to buy in food for to ser service these things. So this year, we're projecting we're going to be down £250,000. Uh, we're not as badly off uh, as some of the organisations that, I, that I've been talking about. But I don't think there'll be many, if any, that aren't going to be greatly hit and who are going to be relying on the reserves. 
and if they're lucky, they have reserves, but their reserves will only carry most of them for a relatively short period of time. Uh, so that, that, that's the real difficulty that sits there. Yeah, okay, I, I, agree. I agree with Seamus. Yeah. <clears throat> it, it, it's hit every single target, um, but some have been um, more badly impacted than others. And in relation to the group business, was there what representation was put forward before the Department of Economy in relation to that? Okay. Uh, with regard to the Department of Economy, Social Enterprise Northern Ireland has been lobbying very strongly, mm -hmm. uh, the department. We have had lots of cases raised by organizations with us in NICFA, and we have sought out the officials responsible for the variety of schemes. When you look at the micro scheme, the latest scheme that, uh, that has been brought in, it says it will support social economy organizations, but then it has a number of other exclusions that I would say actually will exclude them all, uh, I would guess. So we've been making representations to officials. We've now elevated it to the minister, uh, Diane does, and uh, I've written to her. Now, Diane is this person who's been very engaged with volunteering community groups over the years, particularly in her MEP role. Uh, so she has a good understanding, I think, of all of these issues. And uh, I know that she'll have lots of things coming at her. But we'd be hopeful that she will start to review and reflect on some of these things with her officials and see if we can just break this deadlock, you know, because it seems to be the officials are simply saying, no, they're all the responsibility of the Department of Communities. We're dealing with real businesses. Yeah, and from from CO3's perspective, you know, we have been working in partnership with Social Enterprise and we've, we've put out a couple of joint press releases together to put some public pressure on. We've written to the minister and requested a meeting. Ironically, she has said that she has followed us back to the AFC. So and again, I think it comes down to confusion of what a social enterprise is and what a charity is. And somehow the Department of Economy currently thinking that this 15.5 million is going to solve the problems for social enterprises and charities when the reality is it doesn't touch the size in terms of what's actually needed. Okay. Uh, and just to come back on your last point, uh, and then I, I'll let others come in, uh, I'm sure it's maybe for you, but I think we, we've already requested uh, potential criteria eligibility regarding another fund, such as the Sports Hardship Fund. Would it be possible for the committee to hear from officials within the Department of Communities regarding what their potential design criteria will be for this particular scheme and, and uh and for the for the committee maybe to feed into that because I think some of the points that have been raised today and I'm sure members have other queries, but we would like to ensure that this criteria is put to best use for, for, for all charities. Yeah, uh, Johnny, on that point, I don't think that the criteria is has been um, written down yet in stone as to what way they're, they're, they're going to roll that out. Um, I do think, yes, it is. It's one of the many things after this briefing. I have a whole list of stuff here of people we need to write to um, on, on the issues we need to write on. Um, so I do think, um, yes, certainly that is something we will be asking for. Okay, and um, then can I then go to Sinead? Thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks to Seamus and Nora as well. Listen, you know, there's not an awful lot to be said. Um, more at this stage. I think it's all been covered and, uh, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only member of the committee who's been contacted since the announcement yesterday um, by different charitable organisations looking to know how can, they how can they apply and what the criteria is. So I concur with everybody's remarks around getting uh, clarity on that and, and more importantly not making it too stringent um, that it excludes people. Um, I, think the, I think the important point for me is um, you know, this is not a small amount of money, but we've all, we were, you know, we're sensible enough to know that it's not going to be enough um, to completely plug the gap that now exists. Um, and I do fear for the small, you know, the micro businesses and, and the social enterprises. And I concur with uh, the remarks from Carol and, and Jonathan around um, the need for an urgent intervention and, and, more importantly, a collaborative approach 
between you know the Department for uh, Communities and the Department for Economy um, to ensure that there is adequate support there for micro businesses. And I think um, it might have already been mentioned, but you know I think this committee should write to the, the Minister for Economy um, and just you know gently you know remind her and urge her that to you know th this problem's here, it's not going away. Um, and it is firmly uh, a responsibility of, of um, her department, um, I, you know, and just just see if there's anything that we can we can do to urge the minister just to um, to make uh, that you know the, the funding that she's announced um, accessible for uh, micro businesses and social enterprises. So I'll leave it at that. Most of it's been covered already. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, I have written down here on my piece of paper as well that we're to do a letter to, through to the Minister for the Economy, so that's certainly one I think that we will be agreeing on at the end of the meeting. Um, I'll move in back into the room. Uh, Kelly, did you want to come in? Thank you very much, Chair. Hi, Seamus and Nora. Um, nice to speak to you. I suppose I should say at this stage that I worked in the community and voluntary sector for 16 years before I became an MLA. Um, Seamus and Nora, I'm interested in the fact that you have input to the criteria, and as the Chair has said, it's not finalised as yet. But I'm just wondering, in your presentation, you said that there were 6,156 registered charities. Um, they will all be able to apply into this pot, I take it. I, I get the point about there are some charities, and, and from your presentation, there's about 24% say that they're financially okay, or they're not sure. If they're not sure, then they are okay. But I'm just wondering, do you see of that 6,156, are they all the ones that are currently on the Charity Commission register, or does that include those that haven't yet had their Charity Commission register for Northern Ireland um, processed? Are these the guys that are all are sitting as Charity Recognition in HMRC? Do you know? No, um, that figure is for the list of current list of registered charities in Northern Ireland. Okay, okay. So there could well be charities that. So, um, on that point as well, Kelly, I think that. The department will recognise those organisations who are also in the application, the process stage. Okay. Uh, so once it comes to identifying charities, they'll not they'll not be they'll not lose out as such in terms of their ability to apply. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and on just on that technical sort of side of things, you forgive me, Seamus will remember from years ago. I was always into the technicalities of this, but the one six seven charities—that's the charities that have their headquarters outside of Northern Ireland and um, that maybe only have branches here. Do we know if they will be able to apply to this? I don't know information. I don't know, Kelly. Okay, that's maybe something we can certainly. Ask. Go ahead. On, on that point, Kelly, there certainly was some discussion and there was information being sought. Uh, you know, on those sort of organisations and what their access might be to funds uh, in England. You know, that $750 million that the, char you know, that the Chancellor made available there. So if an organisation had a branch in Northern Ireland might have got access through that, uh, we couldn't be sure about that. And my, thought, my thoughts were pro probably, probably not, you know, because the English money itself uh, will will not go very far either. If you consider about 200 million of it was just going to the hospice movement. Yeah. Uh, um, can I just so, ask then, just on this, Seamus, um, social enterprises, it melts my head when people just do not understand what a social enterprise is. It's basically charities that have had to take up trading a trading arm in order to survive, and it's actually cheaper for government when they do that. My concern, and I know that Colin Jess and Social Enterprise NI and you guys are putting um, you know, encouragement forward so that those organisations, those charities can survive, but I'm wondering, has any work been done on the societal impact if those um, social enterprises or any of the charities collapse? Um, I noted from your presentation that 69% said that they would close within 12 months. That's terrifying. And the amount of work that you guys do, and I'm very appreciative of NICFA and CO3 and all the organisations, any umbrella at this point must be in a really hard place. But the work of the hub has been grand. Charities have been working themselves on the front line here. The societal impact of not having them available in the future is horrendous, and it's going to cost a clean fortune to health, to education, to communities, to the economy. Um, has there been any work done on, you know, 34% of, of social enterprises have already stopped trading. Is there anything that's coming out of that that tells us just how much harm is being caused by not supporting organisations like yourselves? Yeah. Yeah, that's really big one. Yeah. Kelly, 
uh, that we have to continue, you know, to look at. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So not a lot, not a lot of research yet. But what we can guarantee is that uh, if organisations that are under threat contract, and I think you could see a contraction of about 25 percent. Now that's that's not scientific figure, but. Uh, the amount of money that organizations will lose, I think, like the private sector, you'll see lots of redundancies happening in the voluntary sector post furlough. What then will happen is that a greater, when those services disappear or curtail, a bigger demand will go on statutory services. And you mentioned health. That is a very, very obvious one. Mental health services in the community in Northern Ireland are quite often delivered through voluntary organizations. And as that gets hit, it pushes more pressure back onto the statutory services and the and the public purse. And we've said this many times over the years. When 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 government funds voluntary organisations uh, to do things, they obviously quite often do work on the preventative side. And if they're really doing good work, they'll prevent the cost becoming even more greater in the future. Uh, and, and the real danger is now that we, we will lose a lot. I mean, of that, but I can't quantify it for you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we're, we, you know, what we're hearing from members is that they're retracting key services already because of furlough and protecting cash flow in order to protect the sustainable labour organisation. And so, counselling services um, that have had to um, bring, bring, bring reduced to people with complex health needs at this time so, and it's, it's, it's an impossible situation for charities to be in. You know, your point about social enterprises and, and I think there, there's a real education piece in terms of what a social enterprise is in Northern Ireland. Most of them are registered charities but not all of them. Um, you know, so and it ultimately is organisations are set up to trade for social purpose. So they make profit but they reinvest that back into the organisation. Uh, back into the community that the set up serve. And I think the key thing is with the social enterprises is to realise, I know in the one that I worked in, in the past, that when you generate an income, then you're not taking that from government, so you're actually saving money but still delivering the same services going forward. Just my final question then is, you talked about the emergency leaders group. Um, I wouldn't mind saying where the minutes are of that meeting, but also to ask for you guys, um, future planning, we're going to come out of lockdown at some stage and we're looking at a very scary future where our charity sector and community voluntary sector is going to be hit quite badly. I'm just wondering, is that emergency leaders group able to get breath to even think about what the potential future would be? I'm thinking in particular, um, you talked earlier about those charities and organisations that are either under contract or have a grant through government that 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 has managed to be held on to and they're getting income. But I'm just wondering, is there any thoughts within the sector about moving more towards contracts that might give more protection or is that more risky? And is there another way that we should be considering as government buying services from the community and voluntary sector so that, it, heaven forbid, if there's a second or third wave of this coronavirus or whatever may hit us in the future, that there would be no, more resilience within the sector? So the feedback I'm getting from members is this is an opportunity just to reset you know, how the sector is funded, the added value that we bring, and the, the need for more collaboration across the public sector and the third sector, and us seeing us as value partners. I think this has to be an opportunity for our sector and for the public sector to look at that relationship and see us as a, an equal partner rather than a funder-funded relationship. It, the, the irony in this is that you know, what the government have been encouraging is that we move away from public sector funding, become more entrepreneurial, or raise your money independently. And, but those, as, as a member have referred to, good children, have, um, they're being impacted the worst by this. So it's, there, there is there's a, a big conversation to be had about the role of the third sector and the, the role of um, the public sector moving forward and how that fundamentally needs to change. Uh, can I just finish off by um, saying thank you? Oh, yeah. sorry, Seamus, go on ahead. Sorry. Uh, can I, I'll pick up on the emergencies leadership group. You know, 
terms of your questions there. As I say, it was the first meeting of it took place on the 20th of uh, March, and in a very, very short time, uh, it's done quite a lot in terms of the work streams. And uh, it seems, when you look back to the 20th of March, it seems like months and months ago. We were really fortunate in that I was approached by uh, a person to volunteer their help, uh, a guy called Angus Lampkin, who actually normally works for the United Nations uh, in emergency situations and providing and coordinating humanitarian aid. So he's provided his help. He happened to be home in Belfast uh, when the lockdown happened, so he's stranded here. Uh, but he has experience that none of us have, you know, in terms of these all-encompassing emergencies, the one that we're now facing. So Angus actually has he's been volunteering with NICFA, given his time free, and he is helping us carrying out a whole review of the emergency leadership group. That's just concluding at the moment. And that is the engagement between the government department, the voluntary community groups, local government, uh, the different strands that we're, that we're running, and preparing for the changes that we'll make now as we move out of lockdown a bit, and more importantly, preparing for how we might be able to stand things up again instantly <coughs> if, God forbid, we had a, a serious second spike or something like that. But, that happened, you know, later in, in the year. So for something that's only just set up, we're actually in the middle of a, re of a review and try to, to adjust things. But I have to say, the collaboration between the officials in government departments, other agencies, local government, and our sector has been exceptional. And even they are all saying, there's a major learning in the future. We will not go back to the old ways of doing business. Thank you very much, guys. Just to say um, thank you for all your work and, and for all of the Charity friends out there. Um, and we're only a week and a half away from Volunteering Week in Northern Ireland. What a year we've had for volunteers. Um, Northern Ireland has really proven that it's a, a wonderful place. Thank you very much. OK, Andy, did you want to make comments? Or just, just a couple of points, Chair, and I'll try not to, to cover points that's already been covered by members. And the echo of what members have said um, is also my questions. <laughs> um, Nora, you mentioned in your briefing document that you feel that the, the 22 million that was announced um, and allocated the, the hospice's money and indeed the, the, the 15.5 million to charities should be a part of a wider pa package of financial support. At this point, is there any analysis done on a figure as to what that wider financial package would, would be? Yeah, it's, you know, the, um, the, uh, 22 million. And about went to the hospice movement, and you know that's obviously and really important organisations that absolutely need that support. Um, in terms of the, the bigger picture and how much financial support is needed, we, you know what when I look at the Department of, for Economy, and I think it was on the 15th of April they announced 147 million had already been released through the Small Business um, Grant Scheme. You know, so you are looking at hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, I would put an estimate figure, and again, there's no science behind this, of, of a minimum figure of about 500 million. Um, you know, NBCO in, in, in England and Wales had reckoned that within the first 12 weeks, you're looking at 4.3 billion pounds of lost income. So the, the financial impact that COVID has had on the sector, it has been devastating and there is more financial support that is needed so you are looking at hundreds of millions of pounds i would suggest about 500 million initially anyway for northern ireland eye watering the amount of money but when you look at the scale of support that the private sector have had access to then it only feels fair and reasonable that that the, the sector should be supported especially given all the comments we've just heard about the essential and important role that the charity sector provides within Northern Ireland is something we all take for granted, but we can't anymore because we could lose those key services if we don't invest and we don't look after our charities now. 
Absolutely, and I think um, an important aspect of our work as MLA is we get to see every day the, the vital impact that many charities are making on the front line for many of our constituents uh, and individuals right across Northern Ireland. Uh, and one of the key areas you'd mentioned about Verlo, uh, and we all know that the grant applications, etc., don't just appear overnight, and there's a lot of time and effort and work goes into uh, bringing those together. So, you know, any any um, grant applications that do come forward should be streamlined in that respect, because in recognition that that many charities don't have the, the staffing resources that they once had, and, and indeed, I would fully support the, the call from both yourselves, Nora and Seamus, in respect of furloughed staff being able to volunteer back in. And with that in mind, has there been an indication to either of yourselves from organisations as to the impact and their ability to be able to apply and, and access uh, funding due to their inability to avail those staff that they've unfortunately had to furlough? For the majority of members that I have engaged with and through the survey, they haven't been able to access any financial support through the grant schemes that have been announced to date. Some have, about half of um, the members have, have taken up the furlough scheme, but they're, they're furloughing fur, furlough with a heavy heart because you're seeing an increased demand for services What a time when you're asking staff, asking staff to step back when they should be <clears throat> step, stepping up. And also, you know, for lots of charities that do depend on income through the, the fundraising through big events, that's gone. That's gone for the considerable future. So there's a new model that needs to be um, is created. But for lots of our members, they are furloughed fundraising teams because they can't afford to pay for them at the minute because they're not they're not in a position to be able to generate income. So it's it's the ability to bring those staff back as well as key uh, key frontline workers to think of innovative new ways to make their organisation sustainable and independently sustainable what they were previously. So there's there's, there's a real need for it on a range of different on a range of different examples to prove that. Okay, uh, and thank you for that, Nora. And, and just, just one final question, if I may. Um, your, your document again points to uh, a considerable number of organisations who have either indicated that they've had to cease um, uh, delivering certain services or they will have to think uh, about ceasing those services uh, in the near future if they continue to be impacted in the way they are. Is there any work ongoing as to the wider analysis as to what the impact of, those, of ceasing those services is going to be? Uh, and again, it's anecdotal at this stage, um, just from engagement with members, you know, what I'm hearing is mental health has dramatically increased for people who are already feeling very vulnerable to this. You know, so I was speaking to um, David from MS Society a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that the, the amount of calls and advice that they're providing to people with MS through this has increased dramatically and the amount of anxiousness and resulting depression in some cases uh, on the back of COVID and the inability for the social contact and the inability to access key therapies has has been profound. You know, and what you're looking at in the longer term is, you know, withdrawal of, of, of key services, you know, for people with long term health conditions. Um, you know, so if it might mean you know getting support to help your employee understand that you can continue to work after a diagnosis of of cancer, or MS, or, or another disabling condition that you may have, it's going to result in key losses of services for people with long-term health conditions. Um, you know, keeping people physically and mentally well. You know, access to physio, access to exercise, access to counselling, access to reflexology and other therapies which lots of charities would provide after this, the statutory support has been provided. So those resources, those services could be lost for good if we don't step in now and support those organisations. Absolutely, yeah, I totally appreciate it. Sorry, go ahead, Seamus. Yeah, if I could just add in there, you know, in terms of Nora's comments, as part of the emergency leadership group as well, there's a strand of work that is being done on well-being 
uh, particularly in the lo- in the lockdown, and we know the impact's going to be greater in terms of people's mental health. The ten leading charities in Northern Ireland working on mental health all have come together. The uh, it's led by Inspire within the Emergencies Leadership Group, and they will be going live with the scheme uh, uh, very shortly, at the end of this week or the end of next, uh, with web services available to people on a whole range of uh, you know a whole range of things that is likely to be impacting people with regard to general anxiety, fear of loss of employment, impact the economy. The whole issue of bereavement is really, really big at the moment on account of the curtailment on funerals and wakes and and all of that. And, you know, they're going to be out there uh, doing that. And as you know, mental health services have have always been the Cinderella services of health. And it was good to see that the Minister for Health announced that they're going to do something about that, you know. So they need to be helped going forward. Yeah, no, absolutely, Seamus, and, and I totally appreciate your update, your update in respect to that, and it will be a very welcome service, I'm sure. There will be many people looking to avail of that. Uh, and in finishing, can I take this opportunity uh, on behalf of myself and my party to thank both your, your, yourself and Nora and your respective teams and indeed the wider charitable sector for everything they are and continue to do. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, members. And can I again say thank you to uh, yourselves, Nora and Seamus. Um, I think that this is something that we as a committee will be um, watching over the coming weeks and months ahead, um, and we'll be asking for regular updates, um, both from yourselves and the department um, going forward, because I, I think, if anything, this briefing has taught us today that um, going forward we cannot afford to lose um, the, the great work that is being done out there by the, the voluntary and community and charitable sectors. Uh, and we know, we know from, uh, I know certainly from sitting on the health committee for a number of years, um, without many of those um, charities and volunteers in the community, um, that those services cannot be delivered by, by statutory agencies. You know, they don't, a lot of them don't have the expertise um, to deliver the many of the services that your um, your members deliver. So can I say thank you for your briefing today, and no doubt we will be we will be talking to you and hearing from you um, going in uh, in weeks and months ahead. Can I say, Paula? You know, thanks to you and thanks to the committee for giving us a hearing today. And I would also like to put in record. You know, we know uh, all of you and uh, you know the members of the committee and i know your personal involvement and engagement over the years with voluntary and community groups yeah. uh, so i know that you have a particular insight all of you uh, because obviously i've met you in all these circumstances and that's greatly appreciated as well okay yeah no and um, i echo what james has said there and just the follow-up support and the actions and the letters to economy letters to treasury and whatever pressure and support that you can offer is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Seamus. Thank you, Nora. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Okay, thank bye you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, members, um, uh, there's some actions then that we need to take out of that briefing this morning. Um, I have a few things written down and feel free to jump in after that. I have down that we do a letter through to the Minister for the Economy. Um, just to ask that they look at this again on how we help um, those uh, uh, charities out there that have fallen through again, fallen through the net. Um, I've that down. I've also done a letter to the Chancellor um, in relation to the furlough, and I've also done a letter to our own Minister um, for the commun- for communities in relation to the, um, the the fund that she announced yesterday in the chamber and how that's going to be developed and the criteria around that. Was there anything else I have forgotten about there? First of all, the room, anything I've forgotten about that you can think of, of a letter to go out? I'm just thinking, sorry, Chair, about um, the letter to the Minister. Um, Which well, one? Of community, sorry. Okay. Um, there is a dormant accounts fund yes. um, that's 20.5 million. It's not 
ready to go yet. It's for resilience, but we might want to ask for the criteria or if any of that can actually be released because there's no point in having resilience if the charities are already closed. And that was the, the finance minister, the Dormant Account Fund? Dormant accounts is, the money's held yeah. by finance, but I believe that the executive, I think, have agreed that that Dormant Accounts money will be used for the community and voluntary sector. Okay, then we'll ask that as well. Um, uh, members on the phone, anything further like action that you want the committee to do going forward? I'll start with you, Carol. No, I'm grand. Mark? I'm fine. Fra? Fine. Sinead? No, Chair. Robin? Uh, no, Chair, except that it, it might be in order that the Chancellor uh, would understand uh, the situation. It might be worth emphasising within the letter that this is the unanimous position of the uh, committee representing uh, uh, very much across community support uh, for, for the initiative. Okay, thank you. And Johnny, if you anything further to add, are you content also with the actions that were taken? No, I'm sure content. You've covered all the points in your letters. Okay. Okay, members, um, we'll then move on to our next agenda item, which is agenda item seven, the forward work programme. Um, members, next week on the 27th of May, the committee will be briefed by the Arts Council on the impact of COVID-19 that's had on, on them. And then on the 3rd of June, the department will... Um, Oh, we will be briefed by the department on the June monitoring round, and we're also going to take a brief from Sporta and I again on um, the, the COVID-19 and issues around that. And then also uh, the minister announced £10 million for the Supporting People programme yesterday. Um, so our members content to schedule a briefing on Supporting People programme for June also. So can I ask in the room first, are member, members content with all three points there? Yes? Yes, please. Okay. On the phones, members, are you content with all of that? Yes. Yes? Yes. Good. Yes. That's grand. I'll then move on then to agenda item eight, which is any other business. Can I go to the phones first? Members on the phones, have you any other business you want to bring up? No, sure, content. No. Good stuff. In the room? No. Yes. No. Sorry, Johnny, is that you? Did you say something? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's probably just under land business, or probably from the previous point. But you, you said that Sport NI is coming next week, was it? Yeah. Sport NI, NI are, no, they're not. They're not coming until the 3rd of June. All right, it's just to, to try and, and ensure that we have the information regarding the grant from the Minister before they come, because... Obviously, that will help inform the debate. Yeah. No, absolutely right. Yes, that will chase that up as well. Thank you for reminding me of that, Johnny. Okay, then I'll move on to agenda item nine, which is date, time, and location of next meeting. Can I just advise you that the next meeting will take place um, next Wednesday, the 27th of May, here in room 29. And please remember that this will be at the earlier time of 12:30, members. Okay. Yeah. Okay, members, thank you very much. I'll declare the meeting closed. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland.